Our topic tonight is uh, China's new politics, new economy, and new international relations, implying a relationship among the three. And new is relative not to ancient China, but to contemporary China and its regime organization. Dr. Overholt has just a wonderful, has had a wonderful, wonderful career. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard. Uh, his PhD is from Yale in political science. Uh, he worked with Herman Kahn uh, at the Hudson Institute for nine years, which is a terrific working environment where he was in charge of, of studies, both for the U.S. government uh, and a uh, uh, number of aspects of the government, and for corpor the corporate community as well. And then, in what seems unusual to some, um, he became an investment banker. And for, it was for 21 years. And uh, worked on things like risk analysis, strategic planning. Uh, and uh, 16 of those 21 years were in, in Asia, being stationed both in Singapore and, and Hong Kong. Um, he's written as a scholar uh, after that. Uh, half a dozen, well actually a couple of the books were from the Hudson Institute time. But he's written half a dozen books. The last two, uh, The Rise of China and Asia, America and the Transformation of Geopolitics. Uh, as he's, 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 he knows the countries of Asia in general very, very well. Uh, he's taught at a major university in Korea, he's taught at a major university in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, He's uh, consulted with uh, um, leaders of the countries of the region. And uh, when Mrs. Aquino defeated Mr. Uh, Marcos, he was her campaign manager, security chief, and other things. So absolutely fascinating <laughs> achievement. Um, he also has a, has a, uh, was a friend and uh, advocate of uh, Kim Dae Jung, who many of you remember spoke to this council the last time before I went back to Korea. And uh, Dr. Overholt is, really has a follow-up to that in a sense that he, he had something to do with the survival of Mr. Uh, uh, Kim uh, in that very dangerous uh, time. Well, Dr. Overholt has focused upon a lot of major themes. The titles of those last two books indicate uh, much. He currently is working on the theme of democracy and development, case study of China versus uh, India, and I believe a comparison also of Korea and the Philippines. The center of gray, and he knows all of the countries of Asia very, very well, and has written about most of them, but the center of gravity of his work is on China, and uh, that's what we're focusing on primarily tonight, and uh, the theme sounds most interesting. I've read a number of reviews of his works in which his bold analyses have been praised. And so I and you, I know, look forward to it very much. Dr. Overholt. Thanks, Frank, for your kind introduction. Actually, when I wrote The Rise of China, and I'd already been going around for about seven years giving lectures saying, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping's program in China was going to make China a superpower and Gorbachev's uh, program in the Soviet Union was going to destroy it. And most of the reviews said, this guy is a complete idiot. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's nice to get so stereotyped as a complete idiot that when things, <laughs> when things worked out, work out the other way, people actually remember, uh, which is why I have a career now. <laughs> Anyway, I, I titled this uh, The New China uh, because uh, China changes so fast and it really doesn't come across uh, in our media and our politics just how fast it does change. I get two um, stories from reading um, both what the hedge funds and Wall Street say about China and what our politicians say about China. One story is they have found the secret of authoritarian capitalism and uh, this is just going to work this way forever and they're going to take over the world. Uh, the other story is uh, this is 
uh, a huge bubble. Uh, there's a guy named Chanos who runs a very famous hedge fund who uh, famously called it China a thousand Dubais. And um, uh, I don't think either of these extremes has any relationship at all uh, to reality. Uh, I won't talk too much about uh, the thousand du Dubai's uh, thesis. I, ha I have a chart, uh, which I don't have a way to display, uh, that just compares the leverage of measured all sorts of ways in China with uh, our leverage, our leveraged finances before our bust and Japan's leveraged finances before their bust. And, uh, China comes in down here, and Japan comes in way up here. And completely different universes. So we're not going to see uh, some huge bubble bust. But let me just compare uh, the way China was in the late 90s with the way it is today. Um, probably from reading uh, the good newspapers, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell that there had been much of a transformation at all. Uh, China under Deng Xiaoping and then under uh, his successors, uh, Zhu Rongji and Jiang Zemin, was run by charisma. These dynamic, entrepreneurial personalities who forged ahead, took heroic risks with their careers to totally transform a system. Uh, one would have said it couldn't have been done. Most Chinese would have said it couldn't have been done. Uh, what are their leaders like today? Uh, Jeff Bader from the National Security Council is quoted as saying Hu Jintao is the ultimate apparatchik uh, administrator. Uh, you know, when a revolution is successful, you start out with the, the revolutionary, charismatic leaders, and then things settle down and get institutionalized. And that's that's what's happened in China. Um, you got bureaucrats in charge. They don't like risk. They're colorless, uh, and uh, that gives a whole different tone. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, the institutions that running China were pretty incompetent. Um, Zhu Rongji said, we're going to cut the government in half. And at the top levels, he did. And, and we're going to double salaries. And we're going to double them again so that people don't have to take a lot of money on the side in order to keep their families alive. Uh, uh, he out Reagan Reagan by a factor of 10. Nobody in this country could have ever imagined cutting the government in half. And China's government is very small compared to its economy. The central government gets uh, a smaller share of uh, the economy than even India. Um, so that was this is one of many tough things to do, but they put in a meritocratic process uh, where to get ahead, you have to perform. Um, a mayor, for instance, uh, uh, is given at the beginning of the year a series of quantitative goals. You have to increase uh, your town's uh, economy by this much, you have to increase employment by this much, you have to increase local investment and foreign investment by uh, fixed amounts, and you have to get cer certain infrastructure things built. And if you make it, then you get promoted. Uh, and probably promoted to a different region with a different set of problems that are more complicated. And if you succeed there, then uh, it's running a country as General Electric. Uh, and there's probably no government in the world that's run more like a business 
than China. There are limits to how much you can run a, a country like uh, General Electric, but if you're, if you're trying to build the basics of infrastructure and so on, uh, this is the most effective way to do it. Completely different from the days of Mao Zedong when policy was what mood Mao was at, in when he got out of bed in the morning. Uh, this is a serious bureaucratic government. Who runs the place has changed. Five years ago, the assumption was that the premier, Wen Jiabao, uh, was going to be out pretty soon because he and the party secretary, uh, Hu Jintao, weren't getting along very well. Well, it hasn't worked out that way. Uh, uh, there's been a bit of a struggle over who was in charge, and uh, Hu Jintao uh, is not so much in charge anymore. Uh, it's as if in a corporation, uh, power had shifted from the chairman of the board to the CEO. Uh, this, is, this is a huge change. Now, whether that will survive when they, there's another change of government in 2013, uh, we don't know. Um, up through today, China is run by leaders who were designated by Deng Xiaoping. Uh, Deng stepped down uh, decades ago. Uh, for a while, he ran China under his important title as honorary chairman of the Chinese Bridge Players Society. <laughs> and. Uh, since then, he's run it from the grave. He designated Jiang Zemin uh, for the 90s and Hu Jintao uh, for this decade, and uh, that has provided great stability to Chinese politics. One of the interesting things that's happening now is the struggle over who's going to run the place starting in 2013. Uh, and that's been at least partly decided. This guy, Xi Jinping, uh, will be the party secretary. There's still a bit of uncertainty over whether Li Keqiang uh, will become the premier. Uh, he's Hu Jintao's guy. And, um, the most powerful forces in China today don't particularly want Hu Jintao's guy to get in that job. Uh, so th this is quite a change from the, the way uh, China used to work. Another change is that in the early years, uh, there were tough restrictions on what the children and grandchildren of the so-called eight immortals could do. Um, the rule was uh, if you were politically ambitious and your dad or you had a name like Deng Xiaoping or Chen Yun, there was an unpublished rule that you couldn't become minister level. And a lot of business CEOs are minister level. And you couldn't become C C minister level until daddy died. Uh, it's a way of uh, ensuring that what's happened in North Korea couldn't happen in China. Um, they've had a lot of experience over the centuries in running systems, and they have a lot of these rules that they've basically carried over from the early dynasties. W one of the things that gave the leaders a cachet uh, was that not only was the selection system meritocratic, but because of rules like this, it was seen to be meritocratic. Now an interesting thing has happened. The princelings, as they're called, the offspring of the eight immortals, have uh, gotten together with former party secretary, former president Jiang Zemin's uh, people, and uh, they've, they've pushed Hu Jintao and the others who, who enforced this rule 
aside, and so the new party secretary will be Xi Jinping, who is uh, a descendant of one of the eight immortals. And there's a lot of popular resentment of that. The, the new elite is seen as very arrogant. Um, people tell stories about how you know, some son of some rich guy did something terrible to their family and didn't even apologize. Just, yeah, you think you can take on my family? Go ahead and try. Um, and the, the emergence of a princeling at the top of the system is going to become a focal point of that resentment. All the pre previous leaders had a military background of some kind. Uh, Deng Xiaoping is a major successful military leader in the revolution. And uh, starting in 2003, the Politburo Standing Committee uh, did not have any military guys, any policemen, or any ideologists. Um, uh, and the, uh, one consequence of that is that Hu Jintao uh, is always vulnerable. Uh, you don't have that national security background. You're not tough enough on the unity and security of the motherland. It's the Obama, Obama facing the Republicans. Uh, except except that uh, Hu Jintao and his premier one are not uh, the kind of cosmopolitan Obamas of China. Uh, that was Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji, whose central career experience was in Shanghai, the most cosmopolitan city of China. And yeah. these guys come out of Tibet and the, the deep interior. Uh, they represent the resentments of Wyoming and Michigan against, <laughs> against the globalizers of the coast, uh, uh, like many uh, here uh, would be. Uh, we, are, we are on the coast, I think. Um, In the previous period, you had tremendous popular fear. Uh, China had gone through two bad hair centuries. And, and, in many, and some of the worst of it was Mao Zedong's uh, cultural revolution. Well, they had foreign wars and civil wars and, and then the cultural revolution and uh, they were, they were just shocked and afraid the place was falling apart and afraid their kids would starve. And they supported people like Deng Xiaoping who said, we're going to change things. Everything's going to be different. And there's going to be a lot of stress involved, but we have to do it. If you want your kids to live, to have a good education, have a roof over their heads, we're going to have to change. And boy, did he change. And the social stresses were uh, almost beyond description. They lost 50 million state enterprise jobs in the 10 years of Zhurongji. The number of manufacturing jobs in China went down by 25 million between 1994 and 2004. Now, our politicians and media people think that all the manufacturing jobs just go from here over there, so they're subtracted from our column and they're added to their column. Uh, that's not at all what's happening. Uh, in both places, as you get more efficient, you produce a lot more with fewer workers. Um, for instance, in Detroit, which thinks it's lost all its jobs to China, it used to take 40 hours to make a car, 40 hours of labor. Now it takes 15. And if you 
do the algebra, that accounts for most of the jobs. Detroit's lost. Now, in China, the level of inefficiency was much, much worse. And the efficiency gains are much, much greater. So they have lost far more manufacturing jobs, in fact, 10 times as many as, as we have. And by the end of Zhu Rongji's time in 2003, people were tired of this. They were like Michigan unions. Uh, here we've gone through all this and he hasn't solved all the problems of China. Get rid of him. And so a new government under Hu Jintao comes in and slogan is harmonious society. Now, that phrase means many things on many, many levels. It's, uh, it's like poetry you have to read. But at the practical level, it means no more Zhurongji, no more losing 25 million manufacturing jobs in 10 years. Uh, and so the message of this decade is China's going to take a rest. You can't take the, the stress that had come with uh, all this change. Um, The elite in this period has gone from a period of pushing markets and expanding uh, freedom of speech and all sorts of other rights. It used to be the party told you uh, where you'd go to school, what your haircut would be, what clothes you'd wear, everybody the same, uh, what job you'd have, who you'd marry. Um, if you're Chinese, the end of all those things is an enormous expansion of your freedom. Under Hu Jintao, the emphasis has been control. Uh, so uh, politically, the, you've, you've gone from a period of incredibly fast political reform. Not from black to white. You know, if you read our newspapers, the only change that counts is whether you elect your leaders. But if, if you're in China, it makes a big difference whether uh, you might die if Mao gets up on the wrong side of the bed. To a system where there are rules and bureaucrats and all the problems that come with bureaucrats instead of the previous problems, which were worse. Um, let me just conclude the political section just saying, are, are they going to have a jasmine re revolution uh, like the revolutions that are going on in the, in the Middle East? There's been a lot of speculation about that because um, funny thing has happened to our thinking about politics in the last several thousand years. We've gone from Aristotle knowing that there were several kinds of democracies and several kinds of monarchies and several kinds of of uh, oligarchies to thinking that there's democracy and there's nasty authoritarian regimes. In reality, there are African tribal dictatorships, there are disintegrating empires like the Soviet Union, there are Latin American caudillas, um, there are Iranian theocracy, uh, and there are these Asian mobilization systems. An Asian mobilization system, society gets organized and says, something terrible has happened to us. You know, Japan's lost World War II. South Korea's gone through the Korean War. Taiwan has just lost the Civil War uh, and is facing a rather big problem. Uh, Singapore is afraid of everybody. Uh, tiny little place surrounded by big places. And they say, the way we've been doing things isn't working. We need to change. And they reach out all over the world and try to find best practice and bring it back. And whatever you did before, if it isn't efficient, doesn't work, you throw it out. Um, that's what Japan did. Uh, twice now, 
after uh, Admiral Perry showed up in the mid-19th century with his black ships, the Japanese sent delegations all over and said, we'll have a German uh, education system, we'll have a British army. After World War II, they mainly went and looked at GE and places like that. And said, We're going to take Walter Deming's quality control. We're going to take GE's labor management relations. Um, and they mobilize the resources of society and focus on the economics <coughs> at the cost of everything else, at the cost of any kind of political ideology, at the cost of military ambitions. They all cut their military budgets in order to put the money into the economy. Deng Xiaoping cut China's military budget from 16% of the economy to 3%. Um, you don't read a lot about that in the more excitable newspapers. Um, and these are populations which have experienced such bad times that when they see somebody defending their country successfully and uh, growing the economy, and we think, oh, it's awful, you know, they, they sell out uh, freedom for a little better standard of living. Well, in 1955, Chinese lived to an average age of 41. Today, they live to an average age of 73. That is not like trading in a year Ford for a Mercedes. That is life and death. And uh, they tend to get the support of their people, and it works partly because they have the support of the people. The Gallup poll in the Kennedy School where I work does a public opinion polling uh, in many countries, including China. The central government has never gone below 80% approval uh, in those polls. They hate the local governments and they say so. They despise them, corrupt, incompetent. Uh, and since polls are conducted at the local level, it gives some credibility to the findings. I can't remember that we've ever had a president whose approval rating got up to 80%. Uh, in most third world countries, the, the professors and the students hate the government. If you go to South Korea, for instance, which is a success story, and go back to 1875, they've gone through all kinds of different uh, emperor, colonialism, military dictatorship, democracy. Um, the professors and the students have always opposed the government in power. And that is the norm all through Africa, Asia, Latin America. China, it's not the case. So they're not going to have a Jasmine Revolution. Well, how about the economy? Well, they've gone through a period of growth at any cost. Growth, any cost in social stress, any cost to the environment, any cost in inequality. And there's There's a feeling now that, well, we've done pretty well at that, but we're pretty much a mess on some of these other things. And so if you look not at the fact that they don't sign agreements with us on the environment, but what they're doing, um, it's the world capital of wind power. It's becoming the world capital of solar power. Uh, they're moving ahead faster on it from a very low base on environmental issues than, than we have by, I don't know what factor, but a large number. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of Japan, where when I first went to Japan in 1963, uh, you could cut the, the air with a knife. Uh, and there were lots of pictures in our newspapers of the little twisted kids with Minamata disease, which was caused by by uh, mercury uh, pollution in the, in the earth. Uh, and this was just awful. You go to China today, the environment is just 
awful. But you know, you go to Tokyo today, uh, or two weeks ago, <laughs> and the air is a lot cleaner than it is here because they started from a very low base, just worked a lot harder at it than we did. The Chinese are working a lot harder at it. They're worried about inequality, uh, income inequality and inequality between their regions. And they decided they would develop their interior. I've been going to Chongqing, which is kind of the Chicago of, of China, only it's got 32 million people. It's the world's largest city. And uh, I was a skeptic. Was back in the 70s, I wrote a book called The Future of Brazil. Uh, and Brazil was trying to develop its interior. And they, sp you know, they moved the capital to the interior. And uh, they, they strung copper wires from Iguazu Falls in the far south up to the north. And they went bust, and they didn't develop the interior. And if you compare Manhattan with Wyoming and Utah, uh, it's been hard to develop the interior, too, in this relative sense. Well, Chongqing has been growing consistently above 15% a year. And <coughs> so has neighboring Sichuan, which is about the population of Japan. Um, and that's most of the interior population. Um, so focusing on this is working. Um, in the process, they've gone from uh, very rapid market reform in the 90s to pretty much stalled market reform today in the uh, part of this was too much stress. You know, the Detroit auto workers problem. Uh, part of it was that in the financial crisis, it turned out to be very useful to have the government controlling the banks and and the big companies. These mobilization systems work in certain situations. They work when you're getting ready for a war. Japan copied the system from Hitler and Stalin. And then South Korea and Taiwan uh, and other Asian countries copied uh, some of the elements from Japan. And China basically copied Taiwan and South Korea. Um, uh, they work very well when you're getting ready for a war, when you're recovering from a war, when you're getting economic development started as South Korea was in 1960, and when you're managing a crisis. Um, doesn't work very well in a modern uh, economy like ours. Um, they've gone from very inefficient state enterprises to super efficient ones. I, I was a little surprised. I gave a seminar at Harvard and some of the some of the China specialists, when I talked about the problem China has today, that the, the big state enterprises have gotten so rich and they aren't taxed properly uh, that all, the country's money is accumulating in these gigantic enterprises. The story used to be you had all these inefficient industries dragging the country down to bankruptcy. Well, they, they got rid of them. Most of those. There's another kind of state enterprise, which is Singapore Airlines. You know, I'd rather fly Singapore Airlines than any other airline in the world, particularly compared with ours. Now, Chinese enterprises haven't gotten to that point, but they're closer to that end of the scale than they are to the typical Chinese state enterprise uh, of 15 years ago. So, dramatic change. Um, Four of the world's ten largest banks are now Chinese. Um, n no Japanese are on that list, by the way. We, we, let's see, we have Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Bank of America. So the Chinese and we both have four. Brazilian, Brazil has one. The U.K. has one. The one the U.K. has is HSBC, which used to be called Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. <laughs> Um, these banks make a lot of profits. I don't know how many, you can see this graph, but the profitability of Chinese banks goes like that. Um, the, the banks are going to have a problem after all the spending to get through the crisis. 
uh, the, fi the recent financial crisis. But uh, they're very proactive. They figured out what the bad loans are likely to be in three years, and they're, they've already done 30% of the recapitalizing. Most countries wait until the problems hit. They say, no, we've just spent a lot of money. In three years, we're going to have a problem, so we're going to sol start solving the problem right now. Uh, the final thing I'll mention about the economy is they've gone from having so much labor they didn't know what to do with to a labor shortage, particularly skilled labor. So whereas wages were only rising in 10 to 15 percent a year range, uh, now they're, they're, uh, uh, they're rising at least 20 percent th this year. Um, a lot of places, a, a lot of places more than that. Um, I have a lot of problem with the description of these terrible exploitative sweatshops that we ought to sh shut down because uh, where in the world, particularly in our part of the world, have you ever seen decade after decade of people's lives improving so fast? Um, you, you can't go from where they are to where we are. If you just try to pay our wages today, then they all starve. Uh, anyway, well, this new economics and this new politics has led to a new ap approach to the rest of the world. In the 1990s, they still lacked confidence. They were a developing country. We just want peace on our borders. We want to focus on developing our economy. Uh, we're not going to get involved in anything else. Uh, they had 14 major border disputes uh, early on, uh, more than anybody else on Earth. They solved all of them, the land borders, uh, except two with India. And no substantial country has ever settled a land border with India. <laughs> Indian politics prevents that. If you compromise, you're out. Um, they were in a very weak position in the Taiwan Strait. If Clinton sent our carrier in, uh, they just had no choice but to back down. Um, today, they're probably overconfident. They think of themselves as already being a great power, but th they resent being asked to do things to assume responsibilities like, you know, fixing the situation in North Korea or Iran, that we say come with being a great power. Uh, we had the same problem with Japan. We call it the small country mentality. Uh, there's a the point at which you're, you're not used to being saddled with these things, but you still kind of want to beat the chest and say, I'm tough. Um, so they gone from what the Japanese would call a low posture to a relatively high posture, but they still don't want to pay any costs. And the focus is the economy. And the costs appear, they say, no, no, we don't want to. Um, pay any high costs. Today, the military balance has changed so that uh, we have to be pretty careful about getting into anything in the Taiwan Strait. They got a lot of good stuff that they've come brought on stream in, in uh, recent years. And They've become, while they settled their land borders, they've become quite assertive about their sea borders. And this, this caused a major change in their relationship with us last year, because they said we shouldn't be steaming our, our uh, Navy ships around uh, in the Yellow Sea off North Korea after North Korea was killing South Koreans. And uh, they asserted uh, rights in the South China Sea that uh, we think are excessive and on and on. Uh, the, 
uh, this has led just in the last 12 months to quite a different relationship between us and them. And I'm going to come to that in a minute. Why has all this happened? Well, they're very confident because of their own success. Uh, many of them interpret the financial crisis as a kind of small version of the Soviet collapse uh, in terms of Western power and influence. Uh, they see it as more permanent than we do. Um, I th think we're about 75% right on that. I think the whole Western world does have a problem for the next generation. Um, mostly because the rest of the world has become stronger, whether it's India or Brazil or China, but also because we've, we've weakened our, our own position. Um, with their changing domestic politics, interest groups are having a much bigger influence. The 90s were this period of centralization. They were saying, we've, we've got to be able to control the national money supply from Beijing. At the beginning of the decade of the 90s, they couldn't. At the end, they could. We have got to be able to move a military commander from this part of China to this part of China on demand of the central leadership. At the beginning of the decade, they couldn't. End of the decade, they could. They got to be able to t remove a governor. And Zhu Rongji did this. He'd see a guy come to a meeting with big Rolex watch, and look at the governor and say, gee, that Rolex watch costs more than my annual salary. Wonder how you got that? You're out. And uh, China was coming together after all this p long period of falling apart. Now the story is the leadership isn't so, in the center isn't so f firmly in charge, and the provinces are asserting themselves, and the interest groups, mainly big state enterprises are asserting themselves. And the, the uh, military is one of those interest groups. Uh, with uh, an election coming, uh, it's a lot harder for Hu Jintao, who's vulnerable on these national security issues, to say no to the Chinese Navy on some of the things it wants to achieve. The media have been on a binge of demanding tougher policies. And one of China's top foreign policy specialists said, you know, they don't have Governor Patton in Hong Kong or Koizumi in Japan or Chen Shui-bin in Taiwan anymore. They need some big issue. Well, they've been very happy that some issues have come along. So succession Toughness is a major asset in the coming succession. Well, let me just take a minute and uh, talk about our policy and our relationship with Asian countries and how it's evolved as all these things are going on in China. At the beginning of this last decade, uh, in 2000, there was something called the Armitage Report, uh, actually bipartisan, it was the Armitage Nye Report, but Armitage kind of got his name exclusively on it. Um, and it said, we've been paying too much attention to China. We've got to get back to where things are done properly, and everything has got to pivot on Japan. Uh, it's terrible that Clinton went to China without visiting Japan on the way back to explain himself. Of course, he'd gone to Japan twice to strengthen a military alliance, and the visit to China was purely symbolic. But uh, this, there was this anger that we were paying so much attention to China, uh, and implicitly uh, downgrading the, the role of our Japanese ally. 
So the Bush administration came in and replaced all the China experts in key places with Japan specialists and uh, tried to put everything on Japan again. Eh, didn't work. We had 16 years of negotiating over Futenma, uh, the, 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 the marine base in Okinawa, and the Japanese made promises and didn't do anything, didn't spend a yen for 15 years to implement the promise. And the Pentagon just became completely fed up. And then we were trying to come up with the least bad policy for North Korea, and everybody got together except Japan, opposed it because there, many, many years before there had been some Japanese who were kidnapped by the North Koreans. And that, that domestic issue of maybe there were a few left in North Korea who hadn't died was more important than, than getting a common international policy. So the State Department got fed up. Everybody got fed up with the economic mismanagement. So, uh, out went the Japan specialists. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, which was not what anybody in the Bush administration expected, you remember what they said about China when they came in. It wasn't nice. They were going to, until 9-11, they are going to refocus the whole U.S. military on this China problem. And but it turned out when you had a, a problem with North Korea, you could cut a deal with the Chinese and they'd be very helpful. And if you had a war on terror problem, you could have our intelligence guys talk to the Chinese intelligence guys and find out where some bad guys were. And that was very helpful. Um, regional crime, regional drugs, U.S.-China issues. And the economy, uh, Chinese are about three times more open to our trade than Japan is, about three times more open to our foreign direct investment than Japan is. And just right down the list, China was our partner. Nobody in the Cheney administration was going to declare that, but that's the way it worked. <laughs> and so by the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, some people were starting to talk about the G2. That was Fred Bergson's phrase. I had published a book. I talked about U.S.-China by condominium. We were running things together. Well, um, then uh, Obama did some very mild arms sales to Taiwan, and the Chinese just had a hissy fit. Everything was going their way. Uh, they had a government in Taiwan that was much more friendly to them. Their policies had evolved, and uh, the, the, the trade and mutual investment was going through the roof. Um, but they had this hissy fit. Um, he had met with the Dalai Lama, and he was very polite about it. He didn't meet with the Dalai Lama. He refused all meetings until he'd met with Hu Jintao. And then after he, and he told Hu Jintao he's going to meet with him like every other American president. Oh, huge hullabaloo. And then pro, the Chinese attitude foreign, toward foreign investment changed. And it started being much tougher about it. You want access to our market? Give us your technology. Uh, and many other things, including cutting off a lot of the important exports of rare earth uh, that the Japanese in particular needed. Uh, and this fusses with Japan about the control of the seabed and the territorial waters, and with Korea, with Southeast Asia. And all of a sudden, the G2 wasn't working very well. China was not our partner. Uh, they had basically kicked Obama in the teeth. And so we're kind of back with the Japanese and kind of back with the Southeast Asians. All the old Cold War arrangements were 
were coming back into effect. Uh, but still things just did, didn't really work with Japan. They had five prime ministers in five years on their way to six and uh, completely mismanaging the economy and can't make decisions and p policy changes drastically from prime minister to prime minister. And so Korea became our favorite ally. You read, read Obama's State of the Union address. Uh, he mentioned South Korea four times, more than any other country. And uh, every once in a while he slips and said, Korea is our, our great ally in Asia. And then he has to the next day say something nice about Japan. Uh, uh, so you've got this shifting situation in which uh, most of the things that either work or don't work are because of, in the world are because of our relationship with China. If you want to fix uh, the environment, it's a U.S.-China issue. If you want the world trading system and investment system to work, it's a deal with China. If you want to fund our government deficit, it's China. Um, but not a partnership. Uh, uh, so we're in a completely different world than we were in 1995. We're in a very different world than we were 12 months ago uh, with China. Um, so I hope I've, I've uh, uh, complicated the discussion of our <laughs> relationship with China a little bit. I hope I've dispelled the myth that the Chinese finally got it figured out uh, how to run authoritarian capitalism for the rest of history and grow 10% a year. Uh, they got a lot of things going on. They got more problems than we do. Um, and uh, their system can go one of two ways. They can revive reform and get back uh, after their restful period under Hu Jintao. Uh, or if there's no economic reason why they can't do that, social con and political constraints. Or if they don't, I think of China as a man being chased by a tiger. And if you focus your camera on the man, how fast he's running, the way I did in my book, The Rise of China, you say, my God, that guy runs fast. He's going to beat everybody in the world. And if you focus your camera on the tiger, the environmental problems, 12 million people a year moving to the cities, uh, the inequality problems, the differences between the regions. You say, my God, that's a big tiger. <laughs> Anything that gets in front of it is going to get eaten. Uh, they can't afford to stop running fast. And they've, they've been taking a breather. If they take a breather too much longer, they go the way of Japan. The interest groups take over, the, and, the, and they hold back. Uh, the, the government stops being able to say, okay, uh, we've got to get out of that industry. Um, tough luck, you know, South, South Carolina towels. And, uh, the, and the productivity just gradually declines over many, many years. In Japan, it started in 1975 when they got overconfident. It wasn't the financial crisis of 1990 that did it. It was the 1990 crisis was the punctuation mark at the end of 15 years of decline. And, and this lasted another 20 years because it was this long-term process of the interest groups owning the politicians and the, the fear and the excitement having gone out of the system and um, the status quo groups being in charge. By the way, that's a risk here after that Supreme Court uh, decision on Citizens United that allows any company to contribute unlimited amounts anonymously. That's what killed Japan. The legislature is divi divided into what they call tribes, Zuko in Japanese. 
And you know, if you're a member of the retail Zuko or the agricultural tribe or the construction tribe or the property tribe or the banking tribe, uh, and you do what your funders say. Uh, and that's the end of rapid economic growth for anybody. Anyway, I've talked much too long. Let me see if I've provoked some questions or comments. The question is, I, I use the term actually authoritarian capitalism. Uh, uh, it's a capitalism conducted in an undemocratic context. In South Korea and its years of high growth, in Taiwan, um, and now in China, you have a kind of dictatorship that runs a capitalist economy. And uh, a lot of our Western thinkers have explained to us over the years that a, a, a market economy and democracy kind of go together. I happen to think they do. Over over the long run, and if you don't if you don't allow real competition in the politics, you get Japan. Japan, by the way, we think of as a democracy. Anybody who elects their top leader is a democracy, in our view. But 99 this gives you one statistic: 99.8 percent of all people arrested in Japan are convicted, which means either they have the best police in the world. And that's a higher rate of conviction than in China, by the way. Or there's some problems with the way, with their democratic organization as compared with other places. If you maintain that structure into a period when people aren't scared and leaders aren't under tr tremendous pressure to do the efficient thing, uh, your system decays and, and, and you get this stagnant Japan or a stagnant Mexico. Um, oh, what is the status of, you asked, of, of private entrepreneurs in China? Well, there are a lot of them. And a very high proportion of China's growth comes from them. But because the financial and legal system are primitive, uh, it's very hard for them to get the kind of money they need to expand fast. Um, the banks lend money mainly to the big state enterprises. The stock market is uh, well over 90 percent restricted to the big state enterprises. So, you know, if you're an American and you, you make a really good hamburger and french fries, you end up with thousands and thousands of McDonald's. And, the Chinese guy who makes really great noodles ends up with eight noodle stands. And uh, if they're going to be successful, they're going to have to let happen what happened in Taiwan. By the way, the old Taiwan and today's China, the same system. Uh, both had the same theory, both Leninist. Uh, but what happened in Taiwan was the Kuomintang Party owned all the big enterprises. But all these 200,000 little trading companies grew up to become Acer Computer and so on, make basically every piece of technology we, we have today. Uh, if China allows that ha to happen, its success will run for a long, long time. But there will be political consequences. If you allow all those people to have lots of money and organization, it does have democratizing consequences.